Uh, so my name is Matt Winkler. I'm a group program manager at Microsoft. Uh, I work in the data group. Uh, and I spend most of my time thinking about things like cognitive services and the bot framework and some of the deep neural network work that we're doing uh, and trying to figure out how we surface that up through Cortana intelligence. Uh, so I've been pretty busy over the last uh, couple of months. So what I want to do first is I want to kind of level set because I'd love to kind of understand where the room is at. Um, and we, there's a kind of a couple of choose our own adventures ways we can go through the slides. So a uh, quick show of hands, how many folks have built a bot? Awesome. There's about 10 to 15 people who have. Cool. How many people would classify themselves as a developer? OK, a slightly disjoint set, about three times as large. OK. Um, I think those are the questions that I had. Uh, so real quick, so for the folks who are developers, quick show of hands around preferred languages, uh, C Sharp. OK, uh, F sharp, OK, rock on, guys. Uh, Node, Python, R, Ruby, OK, Scala, Clojure. We can keep going, but I think, OK, I think there might be one person who raised their hand for Clojure, so uh, Lisp is still alive. Uh, so we're going to be talking about bots today. Uh, this, is a, this is an area that's um, <clears throat> super exciting because it's really been uh, just this explosion in the last 6 to 12 months uh, around the space of bots. We're going to talk a little bit about what they are, why are we interested in doing something with them, uh, and then we'll get into let's, let's write a little bit of code, let's show what we can do with the Microsoft Bot Framework. Uh, and along the way we'll talk about some design principles and some other services that we've got as well as how things like machine learning factor into when we're building bots. Uh, so the agenda is really, really simple. What, why, why not, why now, and how. Uh, I won't spend any more time on the agenda slide. And so I'm going to start off just by level setting with what is a bot. Um, this has kind of been a fun conversation to have as we've talked with customers. Uh, people have a number of different impressions about what we mean by a bot. Some people will think, uh, we're talking about robotics, uh, which is super, super cool, but it's not what we're talking about. Uh, some people will think of uh, the definition of bot as uh, an autonomous software agent. Uh, and so kind of agent-oriented programming where we've got a bunch of these disparate things talking to each other. That's not really how we think about bots when we define them in this context. The way I like to define it is that they're services, so they're a chunk of code that's out there running uh, somewhere on the internet that people interact with. And the people part is important. Uh, I don't really see a whole lot of use cases for bots talking to other bots. Usually we have APIs that sit behind the scenes that can go do that if we want to. The final thing is that it's their services that people interact with through conversation and messaging. Uh, you know, There's lots of ways for us to interact with systems. We can point with mouses. Uh, we can use the HoloLens. But when we talk about bots, we're really talking about conversational interfaces uh, and usually, almost always, through a messaging style interface. Uh, and this is, these are the design constraints around a bot. Um, and this is the definition that we'll be using as we kind of go throughout uh, the talk. Couple things. What are bots not? Um, they're not necessarily AI. Uh, so every bot is not Siri or Cortana uh, or Alexa, for instance. Um, they're not necessarily uh, machine learning. Uh, either. Now, AI and machine learning can both make, make bots a whole lot better. They can make them a lot more personalized. We can create a much richer experience with AI and ML. But you shouldn't necessarily think of uh, a bot as always requiring AI or advanced natural language processing. Uh, every time we talk about artificial intelligence, this kind of comes up. Um, we, bots are not generally self-aware. Uh, they don't have consciousness. Uh, I always want to have a Terminator image um, in my deck. At the big Microsoft events, they really, really frown on using copyrighted images in decks. They'll actually like, come after you with mean emails to, with lawyers and your bosses on the threads. So, but they're not, they're not really self-aware. Bots are there to help and augment a lot of the things that we do. The final thing is, and I always put this disclaimer in whenever we have something that's got a ton of hype around it, it's not a replacement for everything on the planet. Uh, it's not that Excel spreadsheets are going away tomorrow to only to be replaced by bots. Um, but there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of excitement. People are talking about this as the 
the, the third major app model, uh, if you think about kind of uh, client server is be, or I guess fourth, client server being one, then we went to the web, then we went to mobile, and now we're kind of entering this brave new world that's beyond mobile. Um, so there's a lot of hype, uh, but in many cases with most of what we see customers doing today, uh, these augment existing experiences or they make existing things better. So I just want to kind of set that <coughs> uh, context as we go through. Why would we be interested in building a bot? Um, and to me, the most compelling reason is that bots allow us to meet customers where they're at using the tools that they're using. Uh, and to me, the, the classic example, and I think later on in a slide, I've got the, the phrase uh, app fatigue. Uh, if you think about all of our smartphones, at this point, um, the threshold for me to install an app has to be fairly high. Um, I'm not going to install, you know, insert clothing retailer that's at a major mall. I'm not going to go install their app on my phone. Like, I, I don't shop for pants every day. I'm not going to look at sweaters every morning. It's like, so I'm not going to put it there. But I still want to be able to interact, and I'd love to be able to interact with it uh, in a way that's not me going to their website and kind of navigating. This is where a bot's really interesting, because that store, that retailer could have a bot. I can reach out on an app that I do use every day, my messaging app or Skype. Uh, and I can reach out and I can say, hey, do you have a pair of khakis in this size at the Bellevue Square location? And they can come back and they say, yes, we've got three pairs. Would you like us to set one aside for you? That's awesome. Everybody wins there. Um, the retailer gets me as a customer. I don't have to call people because I don't like talking to people on the phone. Um, I get a much more streamlined experience. I don't have to kind of navigate the tricky website on my phone and find a pair of pants and do the drop down for the size. Um, and so from this way, it's actually a win for all of the parties that are involved in that transaction. Um, and this is why it's particularly interesting to a lot of people who are looking to engage more deeply with their customers, because you can develop a deeper connection. The other thing is, um, what we found is that when people are using bots, when they're communicating through a messaging interface, uh, they generally tend to get a much more personal connection to the bot. Um, and this is something, again, it's about you being able to engage with your customers and create more loyalty, create more um, reason for them to keep coming back to you. Um, there's some fascinating stuff that we've done uh, with a, bo a bot called Xiaoice. That means small Bing uh, in Chinese. Uh, and it's a bot that we've been running in China. Uh, we've got hundreds of millions of people who use it. Uh, and it's just a conversational bot. It's not about kind of doing retail or anything. And you know, the connection that people have built with it is, is really fascinating. The number of people that have told the bot, I love you, is surprisingly high. Um, and this is what's, you know, I. Raise your hand if you've ever looked Excel longingly in the eye and said, I love you. You're at the Data Science Summit, so there's a couple. Uh, I totally understand that. Um, reflective in the room, it was a very small percentage. This is why bots are, are kind of interesting uh, to us. And this is why you should think about, if you've got an experience with your customers today, if you've got an app, uh, how you can have bots augment this. It's also not just external facing. Um, we have, have a uh, bot at Microsoft that's super ha handy. It's called the AD bot for Active Directory. And it's a bot, not surprisingly, that's hooked up to the Microsoft Active Directory. And now what I can do with that is I can actually send a text message to it, and I can say, who is Lance O? Lance O is my boss. Um, and it'll return, oh, Lance is a partner director of Cortana Intelligence. Uh, his office is here. And then I can say, oh, OK, who does he work for? It'll tell me, oh, he works for this person. And the reason that that's super compelling to me, and the reason that that's better for me is, when I'm walking across campus and I need to know where the meeting's at, it's a lot easier for me to send a text than it is for me to open up my calendar app, uh, navigate to the appointment, Remember that Lance, when he sends me meeting invites, never actually puts his office location in. So then I have to kind of click and go into the contact. And you know, if I'm driving, I'm now going off the road, and that's bad. Whereas with a text message, 
I can just talk to my car and say, hey, send ADBot a text, where is Lance's office? Right? And so you can also think about these internal facing in terms of uh, internal IT apps to help your employees as well. <coughs> so why all of a sudden are we talking about bots again? Um, you know, there's kind of this, uh, folks who have been around for a little while will kind of look at this and say, hey, um, we had all these people that were writing these super annoying things on AOL Instant Messenger and uh, IRC chat. Uh, why are we even having this conversation now? Um, and kind of, there's a convergence of a few things happening here. Um, you know, the one of the dominant apps. Um, you know, if you all could pull out your smartphones and kind of look at a distribution of where you spend time. Um, you know, what we've seen is that folks spend a lot of time in their messaging apps, whether that's just text messaging or something like Skype or WeChat or uh, Kick or any of them. Um, the other thing that's happening is there's a, an increase in capabilities in those apps. Uh, so how many folks are familiar with WeChat? Okay. Um, so if you, every time I visit China, um, everyone I interact with is using WeChat. Uh, and it's not just texting. You can order cars, you can pay your telephone bill, you can get updates on your electric bill, you can order new cable service, you can order takeout, all from within WeChat. It's, it's an entire OS, right? There's apps that plug into it. Um, and so you're seeing kind of all of these things increase uh, in capability. And so as any platform increases, it reaches a certain point where it starts to look to extensibility. That's where we're at with almost all of the major, major messaging platforms. If you look at the latest uh, iOS announcements about messages inside iOS, there's a bunch of extensions there to enable commerce and a number of other types of uh, extensibility. The other thing is that we've had a rise in uh, what I would call accessible language processing technology. So we've always had kind of fancy machine learning uh, that we could go do to build uh, language models and to build predictive text and, and those types of things. But typically, the set of folks who are doing that and the set of folks who are thinking about building a messaging app are, are pretty disjoint sets. Um, and you, as things like Lewis or API.ai have come along, it makes it a whole lot easier for me, just a mere mortal developer, to add language processing into my applications. Um, you know, uh, a lot of bad experiences people have with bots are when bots are basically like the IVRs that we all hate. Please press one to talk to a representative. Please press two to deal with your accounts. Like, if that's just your bot, that's that's okay, um, but it's, you know, you have to interact that way as opposed to, how can I help you today? Hey, I'd like to uh, update my account and add another account owner to it. I'd like to be able to say that. I'd like the intent of modify account, uh, add account owner. I'd like that to be recognized and that be taken care of for me. And then this is, uh, when we talk about peak app, that's kind of this, this notion of app fatigue that I talked about on the, the previous slide. Couple of reasons on why not bots. Uh, I always like whenever kind of we're talking about hype, uh, hyped up technologies. There's a, a tendency for people to want to rule the world with them. Uh, so I always like to kind of put a disclaimer in about, hey, why do we not want to kind of go down this path? Um, so the first one is um, if you have an assumption that my users only ever want to interact with me through uh, natural language, you have to kind of fit a bot to the task. Um, and if your task is creating rich visualizations, somebody's not going to type out, hey, I'd like the x-axis to go from here to here. Um, or that would complement the app that gives you other mechanisms to go and do that. The second reason why not to do this or kind of mistakes people make down this path is, hey, this is the only way my customers are going to interact with me. Um, that's not necessarily true. Um, there's demographic reasons why that's probably not the case. Uh, and the other channels work really well in different settings. You know, uh, if I'm looking at uh, kitchen appliances, I don't want to look at that on my phone. I want to sit in front of a giant web browser that sits on my desktop that's got a big screen and understand, you know, and kind of open that up. I don't want to be in Skype and say, please tell me about this washer-dryer combo. Um, the final one is, uh, again, kind of because of the hype. 
uh, hey, if I go build this bot, it's going to magically transform my business overnight. Uh, you know, profits will rain in. It will be magical. Um, I just want to put all those disclaimers in if, in case anybody kind of tries this and it doesn't work. Please don't yell at me. So let's talk about building a bot. Um, there are six steps that we've seen um, that, and kind of these have been derived from a number of engagements that we've had with customers over the last 12 months um, where things have gone well and things have not gone well. Um, so we've made a number of mistakes uh, with customers along the way and that's been super fun because we've been able to kind of learn. Uh, but I'm gonna kind of walk through a pattern for building bots. Um, this will be applicable independent of the type of framework that you use. Uh, you don't even have to use a framework. If you just want to kind of you know, file new uh, and start writing code, you can do that as well. Um, when we get into writing the code and hosting the code, we'll focus on the Microsoft bot framework. So for folks who raised their hand who had built a bot before, how many uh, were using the bot framework? OK, that would be about half. Someone who built a bot who didn't use the bot framework, would you care to say what framework you used? Alexa skills, okay. Okay, cool. So when we get into writing the code and hosting the code, we'll focus on the bot framework. Then we'll talk about the next thing, which is actually connecting it up. And this is, this is an important aspect because this is how you get reach <coughs> uh, to your application. Kind of, we'll go through this route with a relatively simple bot. Um, and then we'll talk about, hey, how do we start learning from that bot? How do we start improving that? How do we start bringing richer features to it? Um, and the cool thing about this is these typically allow for a very fast uh, iteration path. You don't even really need to deploy an update to an app store to get updates to your customers. Um, and so you can kind of watch in real time and see, hey, what's working, what's not working. Uh, and adjust as you go forward. And so kind of the, the learning and repeating part is very, very important because we see people get into a pretty tight loop uh, as they're developing these. So I want to take a quick pause there. Um, that was kind of a 20 minute whirlwind through what bots, why bots, why not. Uh, I just want to see kind of before we dive into the how, uh, questions, comments, any any complaints about the presentation because you've read all of four of Tufty's books, uh, please see me afterwards. No questions? Okay. So this first part is really important, uh, and this is designing the interaction. Uh, and this can be as simple as whiteboarding this out, uh, but this is a mistake um, that we'll see people make, which is they don't really think how, about how someone's going to interact, what are kind of the flows through the application. Just like if you're about to design a web app or a mobile app, you're going to go sketch out, hey, these are the steps. You have to do the same thing with conversation. You have to start with a goal of, hey, what, what is someone trying to do? Uh, and how am I going to help them do that? And as you kind of build out that map, that becomes really, really important. Uh, I don't use any tool other than a whiteboard for these, and so the most basic uh, bot is really just a simple uh, question and response. Um, and a couple of characteristics about this, there's really no state associated with this. Um, this is, an example of this is a stock ticker uh, bot, where I wanna say, hey, what's the, uh, what's the current price of uh, ticker symbol MSFT? It comes back, it says, hey, we're at this price, it's up 10%. Uh, I smile and then I kind of move on. I don't continue to interact with it. That, it. that interaction is done. Now the nice thing about this is we can kind of take this interaction and then we can have an arbitrary number of them spread over time. Um, and no, they're, they're, I'm not making a value statement about any of these interactions. You can build very, very functional bots with just this. Uh, if you think about uh, an event bot um, where I want to be able to return, hey, when are these sessions? I don't need this. That's what this pattern looks like, right? I can say, hey, wh uh, what talks are about bots? It'll go return three talks to me and then it goes away. So these are really, really useful in what I would kind of describe as info or helper scenarios. Um, and then they start to kind of move up in complexity from here. The next one really is where you have to have an initial interaction 
Uh, and then based on that, the customer has a number of other choices. Question. The question is, is my PowerPoint going to be available? The answer is yes. Um, we will figure out how I will, I'll tweet a link to it after this, but also you can shoot me a mail or come up afterwards and I'll make sure you can get a copy of it. Um, so this next one takes a little bit more input and uh, allows me to establish a little bit of state. Uh, you know, what the, the example here is, if you have a general purpose event bot, what event are you interested in? Oh, I'm interested in the Microsoft Data Science Summit. Okay, would you like to understand uh, the uh, sessions that we've got? Would you like to understand the food choices? Would you like to request special accommodations? Uh, would you like to book a hotel? All of those are kind of indexed off of that initial bit of state, which is, hey, what event are we interested in? And so this is kind of a common pattern where there's some dialogue that occurs to orient, which is, hey, what event are you interested in? What account do you want to manage? Uh, and then you move into kind of the next stage of the, of the bot. And typically those next stages kind of fall back into that info scenario. You know, what's my account balance? Uh, which, which credit card do I have configured for overdraft uh, in kind of the financial scenario? Now, the next evolution of this is rather than kind of being just a simple question and response, we start building out a more complex dialogue tree. Right? And in this case, we have a collection of paths that someone can go down. Uh, this is typically where you've got a multi-step process um, where there's a number of things the customer has to do along the way. Uh, ordering, checking inventory and ordering a pair of pants uh, is an example of this. So I would send a text saying, hey, do you have khakis at Bellevue Square? They would say yes. Come back and say, hey, do you want to reserve those? I would say yes. There's a dialogue back and forth where I say, hey, this is my customer number. There's some kind of identification uh, provided. And then you can think about that chain as one possible step. Um, other possible steps could be, hey, I need to uh, check in on, my, uh, on the, you know, the pants that I bought last week that are getting uh, uh, hemmed or something. Um, but this kind of, these, we, we call these uh, in the programming model uh, waterfall-based conversations. And they're a series of steps. Um, and a couple of things about this uh, that are important is this starts to require you to get a little bit more sophisticated about managing state, uh, right? Because I have to remember, hey, it's Matt. Hey, he's talking about khakis. He's talking about the Bellevue Square location. Um, and the other thing that you have to do here is you have to start to get more clear about how does someone reset? How does someone kind of say, hey, OK, I'm done. Um, I actually don't want that pair of pants. I just want to know what are your hours because I want to drive by and, and try them on. Um, and so as you kind of think about laying out your dialogue, you have to start thinking about that reset case. Now. These are kind of the three most common patterns. Um, obviously, this ultimately kind of generalizes to an arbitrary state machine um, for more complex dialogues. And so you can kind of go into you know, just drawing out a, a very large state machine uh, for kind of free form scenarios. If you think about how you would model the conversation pattern with an agent like Cortana or Siri or Alexa, typically it's going to be at the top level, it's going to be a big complex state machine where each one of these you can kind of dive into uh, and see what's going on. Uh, the, the interesting thing to consider here is when you've got a messaging interface, how do you help the user navigate? How do you help them understand their sense of place? Um, and you know, the most common um, way that we see people doing this today uh, is really, I like to think about it as like a global exception handler, uh, which is they've always got a way, um, you know, uh, let's imagine, again, we're kind of going with the uh, a banking bot. Uh, and I say to the bot, I'm really hungry. It's pretty likely that the bot doesn't really know how to react there. Uh, and so rather than just returning back to a, the user and saying, hey, uh, you know, input misunderstood, please try again. Um, like you kind of get on those really annoying phone trees, um, you kind of bring it back and help the user. So you come back in that kind of global exception handler, which is I have no idea what they just said, um, 
But when you come back, you kind of help orient them again. Hey, are you talking about accounts? Do you want to understand insurance? Are you talking about your brokerage accounts? Uh, or do you want to uh, you know, find out about local branch hours? Right? And what you're doing there is you're bringing it back. You're giving them some ways to navigate. And the interesting thing there is you help teach them for the next time as well. So the next time they interact, they can, say, they can remember and say, oh, absolutely, uh, you know, update brokerage account. So those are the, these three are kind of the, the main patterns that we see. This is the general one that I include for completeness. I wouldn't start here with most bots. Um, most of them, we've got bots and we've got lasers, so this talk is just awesome. Um, but most of them start in that upper left-hand corner um, off of a basic set of facts, usually in a read-only mode, uh, and then they start to get more sophisticated from there. Any questions on that? Okay. So hey, let's look at some bots. Um, so all of the bots that I'm going to show right now are in Skype. Uh, you can follow along at home uh, if you've got Skype uh, on your machine or on your device. Uh, and so I'm going to open up Skype, um, and we'll show a couple of these. And so the first one is uh, the Azure bot. Uh, and so this is a bot. Uh, the source code for this is out on GitHub. Um, this is a bot that sits on top of your Azure subscription uh, and helps you manage everything that's going on. And so one of the things I can do, I can say, show my VMs. Now, this requires a little bit of context and a little bit of state. Um, so here you can see uh, I've got probably about 10 VMs that are up and running, including three G series. Uh, so someone should probably shut those down, because um, those aren't cheap. Um, but what I had to do a little bit earlier was uh, show me my subscriptions. So I said, hey, show me my subs. Uh, I don't have to say subscriptions. There's a bunch of things programmed in here to kind of map to uh, you know, uh, synonyms for subscription. It says, hey, these are your subscriptions. Um, I tried to say select four, and it came back and it said, no, 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 you can't do that. Uh, this is an interesting case on learning. Um, if I started to see people doing this, I could go adjust the code for the bot to handle this. Right? Because, and in this case, this bot isn't really great here because it doesn't indicate that it didn't understand. It just says, uh, uh, please select the subscription. So then I type in four and it says, okay, now we're going to set the um, PM test demo two as the current subscription. What do you want to do? The other thing that's nice about this is, oops, I can type in help. And this is a pretty common convention. It's going to come back and say, hey, this is what I can help you out with. Um, I can list, start, and shut down uh, the VMs. I can also stop them. Um, that's what I would do with those three G series, except I don't know which of the other PMs on my team is running them, and he might be demoing right now. And so that would be bad if I stop them. Um, and again, kind of the, the thing to take away here is this is valuable to me today. Um, even though it's, you could look at this and say, hey, it's, it's fairly simple. There's only four uh, things you can do here. Uh, because we can very easily, over time, add more. And the app, the, the, app, uh, the bot, becomes richer. And now why is this useful? Well, um, because again, uh, let's say I left the office on Friday. I had forgotten that uh, I had left those machines running. Uh, and I'm driving away for the weekend. I don't have a laptop. I can't go into the management portal. I can't you know, open up a command line somewhere and use it. I can open Skype, and I can say, hey, um, Azure Bot, please shut down these three, these three VMs. So another one of these, uh, there, there's a lot right now that are kind of fun. Um, so Caption Bot, OK, we're going to go off the rails here a bit. Yeah. Ah, so let me show you. So first, we'll log out. Um, so this is an interesting thing um, that, um, so please click this link. So we're, uh, I'm actually not going to click that, because I think it's going to log me out um, somewhere else, and I don't want to do that. Um, so this is an interesting pattern, right? Because the bot, obviously, you want to authenticate. And typically, uh, what you want to do is you will kind of shell out to your identity provider. Uh, 
get some form of a token back, usually in the form of a eight to 12 digit number that you copy and paste into the bot. And that's what you go use to establish the identity, uh, as well as grant the, this, the, the bot uh, permission to act on your behalf. Uh, we've got sample code to do that against Azure Active Directory. Um, you can kind of think about this as a, an evolution of, the, like the protocol kind of resembles what you're doing with OAuth. Um, and then if you're using Azure Active Directory, it's actually OAuth under the covers there. But we've got sample code for doing that. So here, so the pattern, it'll log in. If I, the first time I open up Azure Bot, um, so it's gonna say, do you wanna open this link? This will open up, so here it will say, uh, almost done, please copy the number and paste it back in. And see, now, now we have kind of, now we have completed and kind of rendezvoused on the identity inside of this. This is also the same basic pattern you need to follow if you wanna be able to have the same identity across different messaging providers. So if you wanted to have you know, the same notion of uh, the customer to maintain state and context between, say, Facebook and Skype, you would have to do something similar there because you don't have an arbitrary way to know that, you know, Matt Winkler.72 uh, at Facebook is the same as Matt R. Winkler on Skype. Um, you have to kind of do that rendezvous. Okay. Here's a more complex one. Um, this is a travel bot. Show me flights from Atlanta to Seattle tonight. So this is gonna come back very, very shortly. Um, and one of the things I wanna show up here while this is uh, going and churning and figuring out this is all of these messaging channels are getting smarter, um, and what I mean by that is, what you'll see here is it's not just text that's coming back. So here it's, hey, I searched 139 itineraries. Uh, Hipmunk's thing is that they will find the least agonizing itinerary, um, where agonizing is defined as some combination of uh, number of open seats on the flight and time on airplane and those types of things. So there's a one-way flight leaving tonight. Um, and what's cool about this is, this isn't just text. This is actually rendering a rich control inside, um, inside the, uh, the messaging app. And so I can actually go between, uh, this is the number three least antagon or agonizing uh, flight. And you'll see here, again, this is where, uh, from a pattern perspective, you don't always have to rely on natural language, right? Because here I can actually surface back to the user as buttons. These are the three things I want you to do. Um, I would like to see the flight details. And so what this is actually gonna do now is pop open a browser uh, and show me the details on this specific flight. It could also return those to me uh, in line here. I can create a fare alert uh, if I want. And so what's nice about all of the messaging clients, they're all getting smarter, they're all getting the ability to kind of render these types of controls. This makes it easy to kind of guide your customers, right? Because you don't have to solve the problem of the 18 different ways to say see flight details, um, you know, and you don't force your user to type it, right? Because this comes back, I'm on Skype, I just look down, I click the button, life is good. Uh, then we've got some other fun ones. Um, there's a lot of kind of social type ones. So this one is a, uh, this one will generate memes for you. Uh, and so I sent it a picture of a bakery full of uh, macaroons. It asks me a couple of questions. I say I would like to have a demotivational one. Uh, send me what the top lines are, the bottom lines. Um, and you'll see one of these things uh, here that's kind of fun about this uh, is a little bit of kind of uh, whimsy, a little bit of kind of fun is injected into the replies. Um, this is useful for two different reasons. One is it increases that kind of notion of you're interacting with something that has a personality. Um, the second reason is, is that it, it allows you to occupy a little bit of time. So if you think about, hey, on the back end, I'm taking these images, I'm trying to put some text on it, that might take a little bit of time. 
me kind of sending back a fun little reply um, is kind of a nice way to show, hey, I'm still, something's still happening. <coughs> um, you know, uh, some of the messaging clients will uh, allow you to, uh, you know, send back that you see someone typing. So it's like that really horrible text messaging experience we have when there's like someone that we're, you know, we really want to make sure they got the message. And so, you know, the message got sent and then you see them typing and you're like, okay. And then, then they stop typing um, and you wonder what's going on. Um, you can do those same types of things here uh, to indicate progress. Um, it's not the same as kind of the spinning donut, uh, but it does give you some way to kind of communicate back to the user. Uh, and so this went and created my uh, clever uh, macaroon-based uh, uh, meme. So if you want to find these, uh, they've started to make it really, really easy. So in the latest, this is the Skype preview client. Uh, I can look up my actual contacts, and I can look up bots. Uh, and so this is, will show kind of all of the bots that are registered and published into Skype. Um, there's, there's things related around health. Uh, there's a lot of kind of social gaming type things. Uh, so uh, you and your BFFs can take quizzes. Um, and so these are kind of examples of social ones. Uh, you'll, you'll also start to see brands will register things here. Um, So those are some bots. Uh, and the source code for Azure Bot, and I think one of the meme generators is on the Microsoft GitHub. Um, so let's actually get into writing the code. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. That's a great question. Hey, so when you're writing a bot, are you thinking about a specific client, or do you kind of write it and then kind of figure that out later? Uh, yes. Uh, you end up doing both. Um, there are some times where uh, customers will have very specific requirements about, hey, um, we want to we build a bot for Skype, because we know our users, that's where they're all at. Um, or Facebook uh, is very, very popular um, for that reason. Um, there are other times where people will say, no, 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 I want to be kind of as broad as possible. They'll want to go across all of the channels. Uh, I'll talk about how to do that in three slides. Um, the other thing is uh, there's also sometimes they don't want to go through a public channel. Uh, you know, if you think about an app for helping field technicians, you don't want your field technicians hanging out on, Skype, on their personal Skype account you know, interacting with the company, you probably already have an app for them to use. And so there's an API called DirectLine, which allows you to basically put your own messaging experience inside of, uh, inside of an app. Uh, and so you, you have all of those choices. It's really about kind of what's the goal you're trying to achieve. Um, so now we'll switch into kind of being specific about the Microsoft Bot Framework. The Microsoft Bot Framework consists of two interesting things. Uh, one is a programming model for building bots. That's what I'm going to show here. The second thing is a set of connectivity services. I'll show that next. Um, and as kind of full disclaimer, you don't need any of these frameworks to go and build a bot. Um, almost all of the messaging providers have documented REST APIs. Uh, and you know, as they like to say, it's just code. Uh, so, you know, you too could sit on top of, you know, listen for a bunch of HTTP requests and kind of act on those. Uh, there's not a whole lot of good reason to do that at this point. Um, these frameworks are really nice because they allow you to model conversations uh, and kind of take care of a lot of the, uh, the trickiness in terms of kind of uh, how do you kind of keep track of a dialogue flow. Those dialogue patterns that I showed earlier, they're all very, very easy to implement. Um, the other thing that's nice about these is that they also will give you a way to surface the more rich experiences. Like if you want to have those cards, you can do that. So let's go ahead and get, get started writing some code. Um, I'm going to show this in Node. We could also show it in C Sharp. Um, those are the two things that the Bot Framework SDK is available in. Uh, and we start out by just cloning the repo from GitHub. Um, that's going to go put a bunch of files down on my disk. Um, and then let's look at what we have to go do to build a bot. Okay, So I'm going to pull in uh, the most important one really is Bot Builder. Um, this is the bot building SDK from the Microsoft Bot Framework. Uh, this is going to pull in a bunch of very, very useful methods and types. 
Um, Restify is going to be the way that we go host the node code. So this is going to start our web server. Uh, because ultimately, that, that's what we're doing. We're spinning up a web server. It's going to hang out on port 3978. <coughs> and then we need to connect the bot into the bot services. I'll show why that's important uh, in just, uh, just a moment. And then we actually start building out the dialogue. So I'm going to show first the simplest bot we can go build. Um, it's just going to reply uh, as a response comes back, uh, as I receive a message. And I'm just going to send back, hello world. I've made it slightly fancier by turning it into an echo bot, where it will actually return to me, hey, what was the text that was said? Okay, so this is, this is hello world um, that takes in a parameter. This is about as simple of a bot as we can build. Now, the nice thing about this is I can debug this locally. So uh, what you see here is I just have that app.js file. So I'm just going to run that in Node. That's going to start up and say, hey, uh, now I'm listening on port 3978. Rock on. Um, now, you could test that directly. Um, and, but what we've actually got is uh, an emulator for bots. Uh, and so this is also, a bit, you can download this uh, as well from botframework.com. Uh, and what this allows me to do is have a debugging experience without actually having my bot hosted anywhere, without integrating it into Skype. Uh, and this is super, super useful. So I'll say hello. Um, the nice thing about this is over here, there's a bunch of debug information for the actual JSON payloads that are getting sent. Uh, and why is this interesting? Well, because when I go back here, what's in that message? That message is actually this JSON payload, right? And so that's actually how we kind of smuggle state around, is in this JSON payload that goes back and forth with the client, it's just a JSON document, right? And that's why, that's why I like using Node to go write all this stuff, because it's just very, very uh, clean. Um, and then you can also see the response that gets sent back. And here you'll see, hello world, I think you said hello. So let me go real quick. Uh, let's store a little bit of state. Uh, and you'll see you've got the, the statement completion here. So we'll go user data dot Dave equals hello Dave. We'll save that. We'll restart this. Okay, uh, I, I messed that up, so it's not—it's not returning that state. Um, try it again. Okay, um, but it's very, very simple to kind of sneak state into that little message body that goes back and forth. Um, the important thing to note is that that state isn't externalized anywhere. Uh, and so um, we will see as you get more complex between just kind of like storing, hey, what's your username for the conversation? People will go to an external store, SQL or DocDB or something, or Mongo, uh, in order to go write uh, things that will be more persistent or that you need to access from other applications. Um, you'll want to use an external store for that. And so that is the most basic bot that we can go and build. Um, we can get a little more complex uh, with an API around prompting. Uh, and so here, I'm just going to read in. Uh, I'm going to, rather than just sending text down, I'm going to actually have a prompt uh, where, what demo would you like to run? Uh, and then I've got a series of options. I just pass the options in like this. So we'll save this, restart the bot. And so now you'll see that this comes back and this renders as that card view. Right? And each one of these events I could go click on, I could go handle it. Obviously, I'm not handling any of it right now because I just have the one line that's emitting this. But this shows how you could start to output that. Now we'll go even more fancy and send back a what's known as a hero card. This is a great thing to kind of display the first time someone connects to your bot. Uh, here I get a title, I get some text, and I get uh, the ability to put 
images and links inside of it. And then all you're doing here, you build up that card, and then you build the message, and then you send that back. Right? So there's a pretty simple programming model for this. Say hello again. Let me restart that. All right, and I'm messing something up here. Um, but so this is how you would go and build this. Now, all of these things, this, this gives you that first basic pattern, which is kind of that request response. Um, the next thing that we could do is get more sophisticated uh, and having kind of the, the sequence dialog. And the way that you end up doing that is just passing in an array of functions uh, for each stage of the dialog. Uh, and so we'll go to the, um, uh, this, this is all of the samples that are included with the bot framework. And we'll go to the waterfall sample. And here, you'll see, hey, I'm going to prompt, uh, what's your name? <coughs> I'm going to take in the results, send that, store that as name. And what you see that all I'm doing here is each one of these is a function that sits inside the array. And so this array allows me to create that multi-step process uh, along the way. And so now we've gone from that simple uh, request response to now I'm doing kind of the, the chaining of those dialogues uh, as well. I could do the middle one as well uh, with a prompt uh, to say, hey, what is your name? That would establish the state. And then I could go into the uh, kind of choose your own adventure path. Um, and the way that we do that is by registering uh, the various kind of routes that we want to have, much as you would with a, an MVC style app, uh, and then directing uh, the user down those routes. So that is kind of 0 to 60 for authoring uh, a bot. The next thing that I want to talk about is hosting, uh, because right now we've been running it basically on my own machine. Um, that's not particularly scalable, nor is it really accessible by the rest of the internet. Um, and uh, so the way to go about doing this, uh, and this is what's really nice, all you need is some compute somewhere. Um, so uh, certainly I would recommend running it inside of Azure, <coughs> uh, inside of app services or virtual machines or functions. Uh, those are all different places you can go run depending on kind of how much control you need. Uh, you know, if you have a custom credit card processing component that you want to install, you probably need a virtual machine for that. Um, you could put this uh, in a machine that's running somewhere else in your own data center uh, or in someone else's data center. Uh, the one thing that's important to call out there is that it needs an internet routable URL, right? Because the, for the next part that I'll show, we need a way for the bot connectivity services to actually route the messages to your bot. Like We need to have a way to get the message from that Skype client up to your service that's actually running. Uh, the nice thing is, is that they can be fairly disconnected. Um, you don't have to be super latency sensitive here <coughs> um, because people are already you know, used to interacting through Skype with someone who's typing back to you. Uh, so there's already a lot of latency expectations built into the system. Um, so let me go ahead and show uh, an Azure uh, app service that I've got configured uh, for running a bot. And so inside uh, the Azure portal, uh, I have a web app that's running that is mwinkle bot one And if we go look at this, um, so all this is is an Azure web, web application. Um, and I've taken, the, the reason I like to use Azure Web Apps is they put a uh, Git repository there. And so I can work locally and then just do Git push to the Azure website. Uh, and it'll go ahead and update my app up there. And if we look at what's here, uh, and I'm just going to use the console. This is. Uh, this is a pretty nice little way to understand what's going on from inside the portal. Um, I've got server.js, right? That's my app.js. That's the bot that I've written. Um, this is really all I need to do. The other thing that I've got is my web config. Um, 
or actually, let me touch on an important thing here, which is how do you actually pass uh, kind of secrets around? Because you want to have keys, typically, for how you're going to authorize to the other messaging apps. Let me just show this. Um, so here, you'll actually see we pick up Microsoft App ID and Microsoft App Password uh, from the environment variables running local to the process. Uh, this is another reason that I like um, Azure websites is because I can simply go here. Uh, I can have an application setting. So you'll see I have bot app ID and bot app secret. Don't anybody write that down. Um, and what's nice about that is that those get injected as environment variables into the process. Uh, and so I don't actually have to check in in my code <coughs> what my uh, ID and key are. I can actually just inject those in production. Uh, and so that's a nice way to kind of separate out uh, your config uh, from your code. OK. Um, we're going to be wrapping up here in just a little bit. Um, but I want to kind of then talk about connecting it up. This gets to the question that you asked earlier, which is like, how do I think about the channels? This also gets to why I really like the bot framework, uh, which is we've got a set of connector services that are up and running. Uh, and so if I go in and look at the bots that I've built, so we'll go to my first demo bot, what you'll actually see is I can very easily walk up and I can add all of these channels. Um, and we're adding more. Um, but this allows me to take that bot that I've just written, that I've just published to Azure websites, uh, and get it up and running on Facebook, get it up and running on Skype, get it running on Slack. Um, these are all the places where you can go deploy your bot. If these don't work for you, that's OK. Uh, we've got, again, direct line is the API for you to integrate it directly. Uh, and the only thing is, is each one of these kind of has their own different way of registering, because you actually have to go register with, uh, you know, in, in this case, you have to go register with Slack. Um, <clears throat> and so this walks you through it and say, you need to create a Slack application. You need to configure some URLs. Um, this is an area where, uh, you know, measure twice, cut once, um, in terms of getting the right URLs in the right places. Um, because if that's off, uh, you're going to get an error in somehow how the message tried to get routed to you. And then you might be in the Facebook Messenger debugging stack. Uh, and so if kind of once you do this, if they don't connect up, usually you'll get an error surfaced. Um, but always kind of go back and start kind of checking the URLs. Um, that, that's the most easy way to kind of mess this up. Um, then one of the nice things, uh, if you go and create uh, one of these bots today, uh, they're hooked up to Skype almost automatically. You have to put in a little bit more information, uh, and it'll be hooked up to Skype. Um, so that's a very, very easy way to go. Um, now, it's not generally available in the Skype uh, <coughs> listing. You actually have to go get certified for that. Um, but I think you can test up to about 100 users um, with just deploying to Skype right from here. So we'll go here. And then the other thing that's nice is once you have them in Skype, you get an Add to Skype button. So you can click here, and then that'll just open Skype client, and then you can start, can start typing. Yeah? Can, I Skype can you have Skype for business? Uh, right now, that's not one of the connectors that we've got. You can certainly imagine that's a connector we're interested in building. <laughs> um, and then direct line gives you full control. Um, so these are just the screenshots in case I didn't have internet access. Last thing that I want to talk about, we kind of haven't dealt with uh, natural language at all. Um, <clears throat> and that's kind of what a lot of people think about when they uh, author a bot. Uh, and we've got a great service inside the cognitive services called Lewis. Um, how many folks have played with Lewis? Cool. That's more people than have written a bot. Uh, so that, and a disjoint set. So um, Lewis allows you to very, very easily create a model to understand both intents and entities coming out of natural language expressions. Um, and this is really, really helpful. Um, you know, like when I talked about when I want to text, where is Lance's office? You know, 
I don't want to write a parser. I don't want to you know, enumerate the 28 different ways I think someone might ask me that question. Um, I want to be able to use something that's already done all that hard work. Lewis is fantastic for that. Um, two kind of pieces of guidance I'd say here. Um, one is try and find the right balance and kind of bots in general are kind of doing this right now of what's the balance between guiding them and being completely open-ended. Um, and again, kind of that notion of that global exception handler. Like if somebody says something, when you get back from Lewis, there's always kind of a confidence score. If the confidence score is pretty low, kind of help them along. You know, hey, do you want to talk about an account? Do you want to get a pair of pants? Um, you know, those are kind of ways you can kind of bring it back on the rails. <coughs> um, and so the other thing that's interesting uh, about Lewis is it gives you this ability to kind of watch in real time to see what's hitting and what's not. Uh, and so for the things that you did, like when I said select for inside the Azure bot, I can actually go in, the, in Lewis and see, oh, someone typed select for and it didn't actually map to anything. That's kind of a problem. What do you want to do with that? Um, this is an example of the JSON that gets returned, uh, where we say, hey, uh, you know, somebody says, tell me the news about flight delays. The entity uh, is flight delays. The intent is find news. So news kind of goes to there. This is how confident we think we are. Um, and this is what allows me to kind of make decisions. Uh, if it's you know, very, very high confidence, I can just go ahead and say, oh, great, here's, here's the result. If I didn't quite understand it, you know, and I'm only 75% certain that they said you want to find news, prompt them again. Hey, I think you want to find news about X. Again, that's a nice kind of opportunity to kind of train the user as well to say, hey, if you type this in, then I'll have a high confidence understanding. Uh, and then the final thing that's nice about Lewis is there's a very nice uh, UI. This is also completely programmatic, so if you already have labeled data, you can just feed it in through that. Um, but this is what allows you to specify what are the intents and what are the entities. Uh, and what happens is there's a, a, there's a basic language model that's in the system. And as you start doing this, what you're doing is you're adding training data in so that you can customize a model just to you and just to your app. The final piece that's, in, that's nice is that inside the bot framework, we've gone ahead and integrated loop as well. Uh, so you can actually just go straight from, uh, there's a subclass of the dialog, which is the Lewis dialog, um, which will basically map to those entities. So if I describe, I'm sorry, map to those intents. So you can define set, set an alarm and delete an alarm as intents, uh, and then wire up the bot framework to Lewis, and all of that will kind of happen automatically. You could also, just in your code, go ahead and call the Lewis API and process the results yourself. Uh, but this gives you a nice way to just build right on top of, uh, right on top of Lewis. Okay. So what's next? What are the next steps? Um, if this talk was interesting, uh, if the topic of building bots is interesting, the thing I would encourage you to do is set aside two hours, sit down, and write a bot. Um, usually, in about five to 15 minutes, you, you'll be up and running with kind of hello world. It's really easy to turn around and deploy that and then get that connected and start talking to it on Skype. <coughs> um, and you know, then you kind of get in this very nice pattern to start iterating. Um, and you know, so that's what I encourage you to do to get up and running. Go to botframework.com for all the resources on all of this stuff. There's a bunch of great samples there. Um, and then as you're thinking about kind of your applications, think about ways that this type of an interface can augment that application. Um, you know, uh, a lot of things that we're building kind of web apps for, bots are really, really interesting to think about. Um, you know, internal facing, if you think about a lot of HR applications, like I would love a human resources bot that I could just ask, what's my vacation balance? Um, how much do I have left in my health savings account? that right now is spread across 12 different websites that I never remember where anything are at. Um, I would love a bot for that. And the other thing I'd say is, you know, join in on the conversation. There's a ton of stuff happening in this space. Uh, we've had tens of thousands of developers publish bots with the bot framework. Um, so there's a lot of cool stuff that's happening here. And, uh, you know, it's a great place to go have some fun and build cool apps for your users. Uh, so with that, I've got about uh, 36 seconds left. Um, 
I'll be sticking around for questions. I'll also be at the Meet the Speakers uh, later today. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming uh, and spending the hour with me. I hope you enjoy uh, the rest of the conference.